Welcome to this installment of Supplemental Lectures provided by PNC's Concurrent Enrollment Program. My name is Alexandra Kendall and I will share some information with you that comes out of my history courses at Purdue University North Central. Today we will quickly discuss a topic that was important in the 1970s. Earth Day is an event that occurs every year on April 22nd, but its inception has history and context. Clearly there were emerging concerns about the environment that prompted supporters creating this focal point, yet it is difficult to conceive of the event occurring without precedent such as the Civil Rights Movement and the Vietnam War era protests. So that is what we will look at today. While Earth Day was a product of the early 1970s, to understand its full context, we must go back to the early 1960s for some significant events. In 1962, Rachel Carson's book was published, Silent Spring. Carefully researched over four years, Carson documented the dangers of pesticides and herbicides. She showed the long-lasting presence of toxic chemicals in water and on land, and the presence of DDT in all, all kinds of sources, even in mother's milk as well as the threat to other creatures, especially songbirds. Carson wrote in a style that could make, every, or could make ordinary Americans interested in the environment, an issue that really had not presented itself in this way before. Keep in mind that herbicides and pesticides, uh, they came into use agriculturally after World War II. Farmers adopted them slowly but surely to create larger crops and to mechanize labor-intensive crops such as cotton. By early 1962, people started to see a decline in the songbird population. Those who know seasons of the Midwest, uh, they also know that robins signal the arrival of spring. Carson stepped in with her book to explain why people saw or heard fewer of these birds. The leadership of the agricultural chemical industry launched a full-scale attack on, the Car on Carson and her book, calling her work everything from sinister and hysterical to just plain bland. Yet the public's concern was raised. President John F. Kennedy read Silent Spring and initiated a presidential advisory committee. In 1963, CBS produced a television special featuring Rachel Carson and several opponents of her conclusions. The U.S. Senate also opened an investigation of pesticides. The President's Science Advisory Committee issued a report in 1963 largely backing Carson's scientific claims. By 1970, the EPA also known as the Environmental Protection Agency, was established as a cabinet-level position, and in 1972, DDT and its use was banned. In the meantime, the publication of this book is credited as one of the most influential events in sparking the environmental movement and creating these gains. So, during the 1960s, as Americans saw the people rise up in concern over civil rights and the war in Vietnam, there was a nagging sense that the environment also needed attention. Smog, water pollution, and pesticides all seemed to be a problem. Then in 1969, these fears became real to more Americans because of the media of the time, television and newspapers. Several disasters made it into the news, exposing the problems uh, to more people than those who took the time to read Carson's book. Like Bull Connor using attack dogs on civil rights marchers or the images of American soldiers coming home from Vietnam in body bags, the environment grabbed the headlines. Beautiful Santa Barbara was dirtied by an oil spill. Oil pumped to drive the cars polluting the air. Americans learned that one of Cleveland's rivers was so polluted that it caught fire. Water should not catch fire, right? So we saw at the end of the 1960s some changes in American attitudes about the environment. Americans increasingly viewed cleaning up air and water as one of the top three political priorities of the nation. By 1970, more than 50% of Americans believed this was serious enough to rank in the top three. Moreover, college professors and other scientists were making young people more aware of the concerns about the environment and the scientific basis for these problems. In 1968, Morton Hilbert and the U.S. Public Health Service organized the Human Ecology Symposium. This was an environmental conference for students to hear from scientists about the effects of environmental degradation on hu and human health. For the next two years, Hilbert and these students poured energy into planning the first Earth Day. In 1970, we can see the beginning of environmental awareness as a movement at, at schools such as Northwestern University where Project Survival participants helped to get the nation ready for Earth Day. All of these groups do, don't give, they can't give a personal face to the movement and there were individuals who brought their personalities to this movement. 
Ralph Nader emerged in the 1960s and 1970s as a voice of concern about mostly protecting consumers. The environment was just one of those issues. Yet overall, he worked diligently to get ordinary Americans into grassroots organizations to solve problems affecting them, including consumer and worker protect protection. In that vein, he started talking about ecology more than just the environment. For many people, saving songbirds seemed abstract, but those embracing the ecology movement looked to study and analyze the interaction between the environment and organisms, and that includes humans. Thus, the ecology movement's first flag combined an E and an O to remind people that the environment had real consequences for humans, something Nader was interested in. Just to make clear how much had, had to be done and how important all of these activities were, let's look at one more. Like the Project Survival during 1969 and 1970, college professors and students participated in numerous teach-ins on college campuses. They adapted the power of the sit-ins used in the Civil Rights Movement to bring attention to the environmental cause and get energy for the movement. It also helped to bring another important face to the scene, uh, one who had the power to bring influence from the top. After touring the oil spill devastation on the coast of Santa Barbara, Gaylord Nelson read an article about the teach-ins being held. The connection between tactics borrowed from other movements and the goals of the environmental movement struck a chord with him. He saw that ordinary people were more concerned with the issues than the government was at the time, and this could be a way to communicate Americans' feelings to officials in Washington, D.C. and in state governments. He imagined that, quote, if we could tap into the environmental concerns of the general public and infuse the student anti-war energy into the environmental cause, we could generate a demonstration that would force the issue on the national political agenda. More teach-ins were planned in California, Pennsylvania, and Michigan as a part of, camp, uh, of campus-wide events drawing attention to eco ecological crises. So on April 22nd, 20 million Americans participated in numerous events across the nation. Major events in Washington, D.C., New York City, and Philadelphia tied the nation's historically important cities to this issue. There were rallies with music and speeches based on the Civil Rights Movement model. It would take this kind of outpouring to get Congress to act affirmatively for the movement. Clearly, the movement was gaining power because it also attracted numerous critics possibly in ways that you might not expect. Gaylord Nelson's archives demonstrate that there were a variety of critics. Some Vietnam War protesters felt marginalized as they watched pollution displacing the war in newspapers and in campus organizing. College students had worked hard to whip up support or to whip up dissent enough to, to force a change in policy, which if you study the time period you'll know about Vietnamization and the change in, in the draft policy. Remember that Richard Nixon ran for election in 1968 based on, in part, getting the U.S. out of Vietnam. By April 1970, he had quelled student protests by scaling back the draft and American commitment through this Vietnamization that I mentioned. By April, student protesters uh, had less to protest regarding the war, and so much energy had been put into teaching them about the environment. Civil rights advocates also demonstrated at least some skepticism, if not formidable criticisms of the new movement. The mayor of Gary, Indiana endorsed the new movement, but worried that it would, quote, distract the nation from the human problems of the black and brown American, end quote. Some of their critiques came from the actions taken by rich white college students who drove the new movement. For example, students at San Jose State College buried a brand new car. African-American students decried such a gaudy display of privilege, even in the name of environmentalism. And that says a lot about the problems in the nation at the time. There were divisions of class that underlay racism and even how pollution became a problem. But people were not looking at that. The president of the Philadelphia Civil Rights Organization pointed to these class divisions when he observed that, quote, the polluted streams they're talking about, we've never seen any, or we've never seen anyway. But if we mean polluted sewers, I'm ready to play with that, end quote. Clearly, this man felt that the environmental movement was not concerned with the kind of environmental issues that plagued poor urban centers. These divisions remain in the movement to the present. And finally, let's look at the group that could be expected to, do, to object to all of this, businessmen and their conservative allies. 
Since the end of World War II, Americans who wanted to thwart social change tried to connect social justice and reform with communism. By this point in your course, uh, this, this should make sense to you, but this is a good time to remember the political spectrum. Liberalism, of course, is the political ideology that government can and should be used to help the people. This means that government officials might provide legislation to defeat discrimination or possibly use programs to fight poverty. Liberalism is not communism, but it is closer on the political spectrum to socialism and communism. During the Second Red Scare, white Southerners were able to use the fear of Russian communists to thwart Harry Truman's efforts against discrimination and segregation, slowing down the civil rights movement. Truman, who believed civil rights to be a moral issue for the nation, was not completely undone, of course, and he used his power as president to do an end run around Congress and desegregate the military. Yet the folks attempting to create great change in the nation after so many years of fighting would have to wait until the mid-1960s for men in the federal service, such as Bobby Kennedy and Lyndon Johnson, to force state and federal officials to side with the civil rights movement's advocates. With new civil rights legislation passed, the floodgates for social change had been opened. Women, Chicanos, Native Americans, and others began advocating for their rights as well. With that said, let's look at the critics on the right. Once again, we will see conservatives accuse a group advocating social change of being a bit too on the left, or at least it seemed to be a good way to defeat the movement. One corporate leader out of Milwaukee refused to donate to Earth Day preparations because he detected the involvement of, quote, certain militants interested in the total overthrow of the business community, end quote. Several elected officials encouraged by the anti-communist group, the John Birch Society, wondered aloud if it was only a mere coincidence that the event's date fell on the birthday of Russian, Russian revolutionary Vladimir Lenin. But probably the real truth of the matter lay behind the basic fact that conservatives prefer unregulated business and lower taxes. If Earth Day was a success, government officials would need to put more regulations on business, which cost money, which meant higher taxes. Now these folks were wrong that there would be a major takeover of capitalism because of some pro-environmental legislation, but they were right that regulations were coming down the pike. The president to sign this legislation, oddly enough, came from the Republican Party. It was Richard Nixon. By the early 1970s, considerable legislation had been passed to help people and animals in a variety of ways. We have already established that conservatives were wary of the environmental movement, so why would Nixon, the then leader of the conservative party, sign this legislation? Because he understood the other facts of this lecture and was a savvy political operator. That's the, the simple answer. Because of what we see on TV and movies, we have grown to think of Nixon's last days in office. And that's about it. We imagine the paranoid, unstable Nixon of the Watergate days and forget why he was able to win two elections pretty handily. The other side of Richard Nixon was a poised, statesmanlike leader who knew how to play the political game. He won the first election understanding well what the nation wanted, to get out of Vietnam while saving some face on the world stage. In many ways, he was able to consider problems more deeply than presidents before him. While Nixon was not a nature lover and considered environmentalists to be a little kooky, he understood that the movement had political currency. If you remember, I mentioned that in 1970, 53% of Americans, according to one poll, cited environmental issues as one of their top three political priorities. If that was true early in 1970, he could only imagine how the sentiment would grow with events such as Earth Day whipping up support. So with that said, he signed the legislation anyway. Because of his actions, historian Jay Brooks Flippin published his book about Nixon and the environment in the year 2000, arguing that President Nixon did more for the environment than any other president. What can we say about the significance of Earth Day? On the short, short term, the 1970 event brought the issues of clean air and water as well as the need for factory regulation to the forefront. People began hearing what the scientists had to say about pollution. On the long term, it has only created a debate that continues to this day. There are people who deny global warming is a reality, defying science for political purposes. On the other side, there are kooky, sandal-wearing, granola-eating environmentalists who call those people fascists. Then there is the rest of us. 
Some of us would like to see better environmental responsibility and others are concerned with surviving the slow economy and getting by. It will take some time to see how this will all work out, but for now, I hope that this topic is one you can talk about in class or with your parents or with your friends. Oh, and P.S. Recycle. Thank you for joining me today. I hope that this information will help you in your studies. We all hope to see you at PNC when you are done with your high school degree.